Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Aurora Cannabis First Quarter Fiscal 2021 Conference Call for the three months ending September 30th, 2020. This call is being recorded today, Monday, November 9th, 2020. Listeners are reminded that certain matters discussed in today's conference call or answers that may be given to questions asked could constitute forward-looking statements that are subject to the risks and uncertainties related, relating to Aurora's future financial or business performance. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. The risk factors that may affect results are detailed in Aurora's annual information form and other periodic filings and registration statements. These documents may be accessed via the CEDAR and EDGAR databases. Since we are conducting today's call from our respective remote locations, there may be brief delays, crosstalk, or other minor technical issues during this call. We thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. I would now like to introduce Mr. Miguel Martin, Chief Executive Officer for Aurora Cannabis. Please go ahead, Mr. Martin. Thank you, Operator, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for your interest in Aurora. Since being appointed CEO in late September, I've established the tactical plans to succeed, and I've been working with our team on executing these plans. We intend to demonstrate that Aurora can be a profitable, growth-oriented leader in the global cannabinoid market. I would therefore like to spend our time today discussing the execution steps we're making in our business, as well as our go-forward strategy. But first, let me comment briefly on the recent quarter. Q1 can best be characterized as a transitional period. While there remains a significant opportunity available to Aurora in the Canadian consumer segment, the other legs of our business are performing well. We remain the leader in the high-margin Canadian medical market, and our international medical business saw 41% net revenue growth this quarter. Our CBD brand, Reliva, is the number one ranked brand by Nielsen in the U.S. CBD sector, and most importantly, our platform provides us with significant optionality in the CBD market, as I'll explain later. As you can see from our earnings release, our quarterly results were generally in line with our previous expectations. With cannabis net revenues of $67.8 million and an adjusted gross margin of 52%, excluding ramp-up costs at Nordic. SG&A, excluding restructuring items, was $43 million, which was consistent with our run rate target of the low $40 million range. Finally, as it relates to Q1, we demonstrated progress with respect to narrowing our adjusted EBITDA loss to $10.5 million. This marked the third consecutive quarter of adjusted EBITDA trending toward break-even. As you know, as part of our business transformation plan, we've made some very tough decisions and done a lot of hard work over the past year with respect to right-sizing our cost structure. This includes taking the largest cut to GNA of any Canadian LP. For context, we cut quarterly SGNA from $100 million to approximately $43 million per quarter and sharply reduced our CapEx. Under my leadership, we will continue our focus on fiscal prudence. I can say without hesitation that our entire company is in a different mindset now than we were previously, and I've empowered all levels of the company to look for opportunities for profitable growth and further cost efficiencies. For example, we have demonstrated the capacity to make difficult financial decisions, such as in June, where we were one of the first cannabis companies to take the step to write down our inventory and recost our trim. I also think we have a real opportunity to better align production costs to sales and shift costs from fixed to variable. In doing so, we will manage our working capital investment more effectively so that we can get to cash flow positive generation more quickly. This longer-term cash flow objective goes beyond simply reaching positive adjusted EBITDA, our goal for the second quarter. Our expectation for the second quarter and demonstrates our leadership in differentiating Aurora and setting the standard for building a value-creating global cannabis company. Back in June, we announced the closure of five cultivation facilities across our network, and I can confirm that a few of those facilities are now shuttered. But aligning production costs with sales encompasses more than that. Specifically, our Aurora Nordic One facility, which is a new EU GMP certified production facility located in Denmark, will allow us to more efficiently distribute products in Europe and around the world and better allocate production here in Canada. Before I discuss the performance of our business segments, and in particular our Canadian consumer segment, let me briefly address our recent capital raise under the ATM. 
The $280 million that we raised recently through our previous ATM was a responsible decision in today's challenging environment. The cash will ensure that we have the runway needed to complete the remaining elements of our transformation plan, execute our tactical plans to regain market share in the Canadian consumer business, and be positioned for the rapidly changing global cannabinoid market. We appreciate that cannabis companies are being evaluated with respect to their business performance and their liquidity. And we wanted to ensure that we are addressing both sides of this equation without any perceived concerns with respect to liquidity. We now have a much stronger balance sheet that makes it possible for us to act opportunistically and allows investors to focus on our business execution. In fact, as I said earlier, we are squarely focused on generating operating cash flow as quickly as possible. And of course, as a matter of good governance, we have also filed a new shelf perspective. This is a common step for most large companies to have available if needed. Now let's discuss our business itself, beginning with the Canadian consumer market, where we have much work to do to gain share, but also a strong sense of urgency to continue executing our well-thought-out tactical plans. As you know, there are two things to consider that are working in our favor, and in doing so, providing us with considerable tailwinds. First, the category is growing, with StatsCan data showing 11% month-over-month growth in July and another 5% in August, and more stores continue to open, particularly in the province of Ontario, which is very encouraging news. In fact, from the national data that we have seen, the current store count is approximately 1,200 and could reach 1,300 by December. And second, the consumer has demonstrated very dynamic tendencies with market share moving very quickly between brands, unlike in more stable CPG categories. This provides us with a great opening for our pivot to premium brands. These factors suggest to us that with the right accountabilities and focus, the right products, the right sales execution, including product availability, visibility, packaging, and better engagement with the provinces, we can gain share in key growth categories quickly, all while achieving profitability. The data from Canada and other mature markets indicate that premium and super premium brands have been and will continue to be successful in all formats. Therefore, Aurora has a real opportunity for a more articulated and balanced portfolio offering with a greater focus on higher margin and sustainable premium assets such as vapes, pre-rolls, and premium flower offerings across multiple price tiers. For example, gummies is a format where we have a number one position, and we are allocating additional resources so that we can enhance and grow that format. We are also working to expand our leading concentrates and to refocus our dried flower business toward higher gross profit dollar pools. Of course, premium segments must also be supported with classic CPG sales, marketing, trade marketing, and consumer engagement methodologies to build awareness, foster affinity, and generate outsized returns. The key, of course, is to ensure that in doing so, we're delivering more dollars to the gross profit line versus simply just delivering low margin revenue. We are therefore much more interested in our market share within premium and super premium categories, along with our market share of categories such as vapor, pre-rolls, and concentrates that are margin accretive compared to our market share in the deep discount flower business. While it's still early days, I'm happy to say that we're starting to see some green shoots from these initiatives, and suggest that you keep tabs on the headset data and other market data so that you can gauge our ongoing performance. For example, we're very encouraged by the great response to the phase one of our vape slots that recently hit the market. We're also seeing strong demand from our ACES pre-roll and are currently working through some supply constraints, but hope to have those issues resolved soon so that we can have broader distribution in that key product category. Let me also say that within vapes and pre-rolls, there's a lot of opportunity to bring classic CPG elements in packaging and alignment that traditional flower does not lend itself to. We've accelerated our focus on our premium brands, Aurora and San Raf, as well as our super premium brand, Whistler. These are tremendous assets that balance out the total offering to our consumers. Our intention is to build an ecosystem around each of them through various formats to foster greater brand visibility and provide greater choices to the consumer where they can work up the value chain. As an example, we are working to extend these brands to include San Raf pre-rolls and a higher quality Whistler Vape. Through all these initiatives, our intention is to generate not just revenue, but quality revenue that will deliver a healthy gross profit dollar as opposed to essentially just a gross margin percentage. Whistler, for example, example, currently delivers 10 times the gross profit dollars per gram that a disco brand might. So our path forward in putting more dollars to the bottom line is based on the notion that not all revenue dollars are created equal. On a related note, while we continue to support our daily special brand, we think the value segment may provide an opportunity to shift production and manufacturing costs to a more variable model 
and we are exploring that opportunity. This variable model could also allow us to better control inventory build. In my 20 plus years of working with products in dynamic categories, I've seen many examples of there being an advantage to having more flexibility with a variable cost model. Now, let me turn your attention to our domestic and international medical businesses, which are operating well and delivered a 4% revenue increase over the last quarter. While our Canadian medical revenue declined slightly over the prior quarter, this segment is an evolving landscape and we're extremely happy with our ability to manage that business. We have moved our patient intake and experience online and can now offer substantially more choices to our patients and veterans as a result. While the medical channel over time may see some migration to the consumer channel, we see opportunities to retain and grow key patient groups, like veterans, to continue to grow the medical market. Our international medical segment has been a consistent performer and reported a 41% increase in Q1. We are already one of the leading providers of flour in Germany, and we continue to see opportunities in the oil market. We also just cleared an important regulatory milestone for the Aurora Nordic One production facility in Denmark, which just achieved GMP certification and its sales license for flour and oil. This facility is now able to ship from Denmark to Germany, as well as the rest of the EU and other parts of the world. There is certainly a great lesson here from our success to date in the global medical market that has positive implications for our other opportunities, namely that it takes a lot of investment, a lot of compliance expertise, and a lot of thought to be successful with the high standards that these international markets require. But once those capabilities are built out, they become very portable. We are bullish on the long-term international market opportunity and believe that Aurora, with our demonstrated expertise and medical market leadership, is very well positioned to continue to generate enduring shareholder value from international business as these markets develop. Lastly, our Nielsen top-ranked U.S. CBD brand, Reliva, remains an enviable strategic platform despite the temporary slow growth due to COVID. Our platform already provides us with a critical distribution and regulatory expertise and relationships, both advantages as the U.S. market continues to evolve. Reliva focuses on brick and mortar stores and is an exclusive CBD supplier for some of the largest retailers and wholesalers nationally, and our products are in over 23,000 stores. This may be seen as an unusual approach in a COVID environment given the general consumer shift to online sales, but our trade partners have taken a really dim view to those that have pivoted to online sales amid the pandemic, and we decided to stick with them for the long term. Given its variable cost model, Reliva is even a positive and is an asset light model that does not require any CapEx. Looking ahead, we're very bullish on what we've heard out of the FDA and anticipate positive action. So when the FDA moves forward, those companies with a history of compliance and experience in brick and mortar will win. We therefore think Reliva is a wonderful asset and will continue to be a significant EBITDA contributor. Oh, and will be a significant EBITDA contributor. According to the most conservative estimate, CBD represents about $2 billion in retail revenue. So when we talk about global cannabinoids and leveraging Aurora Science and Innovation, the non-THC parts of our portfolio could potentially be bigger than the THC parts of our portfolio, particularly with positive FDA action in the U.S. I'll now turn it over to Glenn to walk through the financial details. Thanks, Miguel. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us in today's call. I will take a few minutes to review our first quarter 2021 results. Please note that the figures I'll be going over today can be found in the press release we issued this morning and are all in Canadian dollars unless otherwise stated. I should also note that, in accordance with IFRS standards, the comparative revenue figures for Q4 2020 have been reduced slightly to reflect the removal of discontinued operations results from our ancillary revenues. For our first quarter fiscal 2021, the period from July 1st to September 30th, 2020, our net revenue, all of it from cannabis businesses, came in at $67.8 million, a bit higher than the 60 to $64 million range we previously provided. Our sales mix remains evenly split with the consumer cannabis segment delivering $34.3 million in net revenue and our medical cannabis segment delivering $33.5 million in net revenue. So let me dig into revenue a bit further. In the first quarter, our medical revenue was up slightly. Underlying this was a temporary decrease in Canada of about $600,000 as we transitioned all of our patients to a new integrated sales platform where they have access now to all Aurora medical brands, including MedRelief, Canamed, and Aurora, and soon Whistler. Aurora continues to have a significant advantage in Canadian medical market share. 
but more than offsetting that temporary decline with a stellar performance from our international medical business, which continued to show the strength of our expertise and brands with a 41% increase quarter over quarter to almost $6.5 million of revenue. I should remind you that our leadership in the Canadian and international medical markets is very important to our bottom line and long-term value creation, bringing sustainable growth expectations and a very solid gross margin profile, averaging in the high 60% range in both Canada and internationally. Our Q1 consumer revenue declined 3% over Q4, this despite a growing overall market. Now, Miguel has outlined both the challenges and the opportunity for Aurora in the Canadian consumer market, and we see Q1 consumer revenue as reflecting that period of transition for us. Despite the challenges, there were certainly some bright spots in performance, including $2.5 million increase in derivative product sales and a $1.1 million increase in U.S. CBD revenues. We also recently launched our daily special vape offering, quickly capturing consumer attention in the number three spot in Ontario. Of course, this is just the first vape launch in a planned full brand portfolio of vape offerings in the near term. Turning now to our margins. Adjusted gross margin before fair, fair value adjustments on overall cannabis net revenue remains strong at 48% in Q1, and this compares to 50% in the prior quarter. But excluding the $2.6 million of ramp-up costs at our Aurora Nordic facility in Denmark, our overall Q1 adjusted gross margin was actually 52%. Medical margins continued to deliver important levels of profit at 67% overall, excluding the Nordic ramp-up costs. And consumer margins improved to 38% due mainly to product mix with a heavier weighting on 2.0 products in the quarter. While inventory levels increased about $27 million overall from the previous quarter, we are making progress in reducing this growth. And as Miguel has noted in his remarks, between the facility closures currently being executed and opportunities to align current demand and production needs at our ongoing facilities, we expect to bring this into balance during the fiscal year. Cannabis is a long lead time agricultural crop with a challenging demand schedule to forecast, so alignment does take a bit of time. Hence, Miguel's remarks regarding shifting more fixed costs to variable over time are also very important to our plans to drive to sustainable positive cash flow in the near future. Looking now at SGNA, including R&D. We have successfully reduced SGNA costs, which we define as including R&D spending as well, to our announced target of the low $40 million range, taking it from over $100 million in Q2 2020 down to $43 million in Q1 2021. This excludes approximately $4 million of termination costs related to the business reset. As an important driver of our profitability and positive cash flow, I'm encouraged to tell you that we're continuing to operate our targeted quarterly sg run rate in Q2 and have the entire company incented to find incremental opportunities to hold and even reduce this important metric. We do believe this level of sg spend is quite sustainable and capable of supporting a much higher revenue line. So pulling all of this together, adjusted EBITDA in Q1 2021 with a loss of $57.5 million. But that included a number of previously communicated restructuring costs, including employee and contract terminations. Adjusting for these costs, and in accordance with our bank covenant definition, adjusted EBITDA for Q1 is $10.5 million. This is the third consecutive quarter of improvement as we continue to work towards positive EBITDA and cash flow. I'll just uh, make a couple of comments regarding our cash position and cash flows now. So as of November 6th, our consolidated cash position was $250 million, and that compares to $162 million as at June 30th. This balance reflects the improvements in our recurring cash flows, which I'll describe in a moment, as well as cash raised through our ATM program in the last couple of months. It also reflects payments in October for our major annual costs of insurance and employee bonuses. The balance on our term debt stands at $101 million at November 6th, and we remain in compliance with all debt covenants under this agreement. We are very happy with the continued excellent relationship and ongoing dialogue we have with our very supportive banking partners. For cash flow, the amount of cash we used in Q1 was similar to that in the prior quarter. However, the mix within cash use showed significant positive progress. 
We used $25.2 million in cash to fund operations, excluding work and capital investments, and used $47.4 million for contract and employee termination costs. These costs included the previously announced termination of the UFC agreement. We also paid $15 million for capital expenditures in Q1, down materially as many long wait projects are now complete. Increases in net working capital used $37 million in the quarter, driven by a $14 million increase in accounts receivable and a $25 million increase in inventory. As both Miguel and I have described earlier, we continue to execute plans to more closely align production levels with demand. Finally, in the quarter, we also used $18.2 million in cash to reduce our term debt and lease obligations. So cash used in operations and for capital expenditures are crucial metrics in our drive towards generating sustainable, positive free cash flow. And both have improved significantly and consistently over the past several quarters. As an example, in our Q2 2020 fiscal quarter, that's the last quarter before we announced our business transformation plan, we used $86 million cash in operations, not counting working capital bills and $128 million for capital expenditures, so a total outflow of $214 million for just these two items. This compares to our just reported Q1 total of about $40 million for these same two items. We made the decision to reposition our company to be a leader in our industry in driving deposit EBITDA and cash flow. The actions we have taken have improved cash outflow on these recurring items by over 80% within three quarters. Even with a solid balance sheet and rapidly improving cash flows, we still believe that access to capital is of paramount importance, particularly in an environment of rapid change and value-driving opportunities. So you will have noted that we recently filed a new shelf prospectus that is intended to protect the company and our shareholders as we navigate through an uncertain environment. But we are firmly convinced that our focus on getting the cash flow positive as quickly as possible with, will both demonstrate the excellent long-term value creation possible in this industry and will alleviate the need for additional equity capital as far as possible. As we have shown with our progress on the business transformation, we will continue to prudently manage our liquidity as we drive to positive EBITDA and cash flow. So to conclude, and as I mentioned in our last report to you, I'm incredibly excited for the vision and tactical plan that Miguel has laid out here. I am seeing the recovery in our Canadian consumer business showing signs of traction. And when you add that to the leading position we have in medical cannabis globally, the excellent gross margins we continue to deliver, a vastly improved SG&A cost structure, an important platform for U.S. growth, and a much improved balance sheet, you may be able to understand why, are quite, why we are quite bullish for Aurora's future and for our shareholders. So thanks for taking the time with us in a very busy reporting day. Before we take questions, I'd like to now turn the call back to Miguel for a few wrap-up remarks. Miguel? Thanks, Glenn. I want to close by highlighting the steps of the plan we're executing now for the Canadian consumer market. First, we're focused on driving sales of premium brands and flour. Whistler, San Rap, and Aurora. Second, we are focused on winning share in key growth formats, vapor, pre-rolls, edibles, and concentrates. And third, evaluating and executing on opportunities to align our production and manufacturing costs to sales and shift our model away from fixed to variable costs. I'm very confident in the early execution of these tactical plans. We know what we need to do to be successful across our main markets and are already seeing early signs that run the right path. As CEO, it is my responsibility to ensure that the entire team is executing accordingly to their respective responsibilities. This entails continuously looking for more effective ways to capture top-line opportunities that are margin accretive and extract even more efficiencies from operations. When we are successful, we not only strengthen our financial condition, but over time build a sustainable and growing level of adjusted EBITDA and the base of positive free cash flow that can be used to invest globally over a multi-year horizon in both the THC and non-THC cannabinoids. We look forward to sharing our progress with respect to our plans and in reaching these goals over the coming quarters. Thank you. Operator, if you could please open it up for questions. Thank you. We will now be conducting a question and answer session. We ask that all callers limit themselves to one question and one follow-up. If you have additional questions, you may requeue, and those questions will be addressed time permitting. 
If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Thank you. Our first question comes from the line of Vivian Azer with Cowan. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good morning. Morning, Viv. So understanding this is a transitional quarter, uh, like maybe let's take it a little bit more near term. Obviously, a lot of volatility in the markets. Elections are incredibly topical um, in the United States. So, Miguel, um, perhaps this is a great opportunity for you to level set everyone on what you view as the tangible and likely regulatory pathways um, for a more notable entry into the U.S. beyond CBD? Uh, well, good morning, Vivian, and it's a great question. I think, you know, like most things with me, you know, my background really colors my opinion. And having spent 20 to 25 years in the tobacco business, you saw a lot of uncertainty, and there are a lot of corollaries here. So first and foremost, while everyone is hyper-focused on potential federal action, I would really draw your attention to what's happening at the states. When you talk about controlled substances and you talk about regulated products, State-level actions, in, in many ways, have more applicability in the short term than federal actions. You see that in CBD today in the U.S., in the cannabinoid business, and you clearly see it uh, in the THC-bearing cannabinoids. We had four really important states pass comprehensive uh, cannabis legislation, and so that you know, starts to move the ball forward in terms of when do you get to this tipping point. Now, on the federal side, you know, the Biden-Harris position is clear, and I think you know, it's going to have to be a little more articulated on what the timing is. But, you know, depending on what happens with the runoff election in Georgia, you know, the Republicans' control of the Senate has a, a key impact. So all in all, if you boil that all down, I guess I would say the following sort of three things. First and foremost, very positive news at the state level. We see uh, both in the U.S. and globally um, an increasing sort of openness towards THC-bearing cannabinoids, and that bodes well for a company like Aurora. Secondly, um, there is you know, work to be done to see what a federal construct looks like. Um, and third, and I think this is the most important piece by far, is if and when you see countries, including the U.S., pass federal uh, regulations and legislation, the experiences that the Canadians LPs have had in Canada as the largest federal construct on manufacturing, packaging, production, sales and marketing, all of those things instantly becomes really valuable. By the same token, the rigors getting into a Germany or a Poland um, or an Israel, that is muscle memory that you can't just, you know, replicate, you know, really quickly. So we continue to learn. We continue to see those, uh, you know, pieces as being portable. And at a time in which, you know, there is an opening for us in the U.S., we think that we'll have a ton of resources and a ton of interest because of all of those experiences. And so that's um, how I would couch it. And it's, you know, I'm not here to give a particular timeline because I think that's, you know, as you know, that's folly for trying to predict uh, legislation like this uh, at a federal level. Absolutely. And, and I appreciate that perspective. Miguel, if I can squeeze in a follow-up then. Sure. Um, as it relates to the Senate election, to the extent that the Democrats do not take the Senate, do you want to offer a view on what that means in terms of pathways and catalysts? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, you know, it's easy to say that, you know, if, if uh, Senator McConnell and the Republicans keep control of the Senate, that that's sort of it. I mean, as we've learned with states like Illinois, uh, the economic, you know, benefits of, you know, legalization of medical or, or rec um, has become a bit of a bipartisan issue. And so, you know, I think we'd have to see, unfortunately, with the pandemic of COVID, you're seeing a lot of budget shortfalls and a lot of people are looking towards, you know, a responsible regulated version of cannabis in order to fill that. So I think, you know, Vivian, we'll have to see, but, you know, I understand that historical positions would be that the Democrats are always going to support it and the Republicans always won't. That's not the case. We have not seen that in CBD as an example. When you look at Republican governors, um, particularly in, say, Texas or Florida, seeing the benefits of a regulated, uh, thoughtful approach on non-TSC-bearing cannabinoids. And I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that the Republicans 
uh, given their focus on fiscal prudence, wouldn't also have a similar opinion under the right construct. And again, you know, those companies that have acted responsibly in a compliance uh, driven manner in Canada clearly are going to have an advantage uh, when that construct presents itself. Understood. Thanks for the time. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from the line of Pablo Zwanek with Cantor Fitzgerald. Please proceed with your question. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Pablo. Good morning. To, 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 I guess uh, the first question would be just following up on the last one. When you see a canopy growth licensing Tokyo Smoke and Tweed uh, to acreage and building awareness for their brands, and you hear Afria talk about the strategic relevance of the sweet water deal in craft beer to build relevance for their brands, do you think you, you need to do something similar uh, to push or to start building awareness for your brands in the U.S., or, or it's just too early and there's still enough time to, to get behind that? Thanks. Well, uh, thank you for the thoughtful question, Pablo. I mean, listen, I, I'm not here to be critical on anyone else's approach, particularly as it builds awareness. I think the two examples you gave are, are a bit different. Um, you know, one is about leveraging infrastructure and expertise, and the second, to your point, is about awareness. You know, my opinion is that when you have high-quality brands um, that can operate in a variety of different markets, um, as we do, you know, I think there's, you know, opportunity. The biggest thing, though, you know, Pablo, to me, is all of your capabilities to be able to execute at a time in which it makes sense. Obviously, there are challenges, structural challenges, for publicly traded companies to operate today in the U.S. That doesn't mean, though, that you can't build infrastructure and capabilities for a time in which it is federally regulated, and that's really what we're focused on. So, you know, we will be opportunistic. I clearly expect that a lot of folks will be deeply interested in what we've been able to do around the world from a regulated standpoint. Um, I would also tell you that the science and genetics and genomics um, and experience with the plant may be um, one of the most portable sort of aspects um, of both our business and other pieces of business. So it doesn't give me any pause um, you know, that our friends at Canopy have, have done what they've done and that the folks of AFRI have done what they've done uh, with the craft brewery in Atlanta. Um, we feel very confident with our position. We feel very confident that the resources that we have will be attractive and at a time in which it makes sense, um, you know, you'll see us be there. Okay, and just a quick follow-up on the Canadian sure. tech market. Uh, I don't think there's much in the press release about outlook or comments on the quarter, but uh, – uh, obviously, you beat in the in, in the September quarter, right? 68 million versus 60 to 64. Maybe you know what drove that because guidance was given late in the September quarter. But more important than that, you know, where are we? What what comments can you give in terms of guidance or outlook for the December quarter in REC? With with the I guess with the slight concern on my side that when I look at the market data, particularly high fire, I see evidence of the successful pivot in the derivatives and the premium brands. But I see a big collapse um, in sales of your value flower business, right, which is still relevant to your total revenue. So I wonder what that means to your total rec sales in the December quarter. So some, just some color there uh, in terms of a bit and in terms of uh, where we are in the, in the December quarter in rec. Thanks. All right. I'll take the second half, and then I'll turn it over to Glenn to sort of talk about the first half. So, you know, as I mentioned, it, it, these are big, you know, ships to sort of move. Clearly, I've been unabashed in my focus on – you know, premium flour, derivatives, vapor, which obviously I have a long history in, given I was, just, you know, running logic. And so, you know, what I would say is this. There is a lot of folks that are pumping out low-cost flour at the low end, and that's had an impact. And you're going to see disruption as us and, and others right-size production uh, to consumer demand. And so that is what it is, and, and you can sort of get there. I think as you look at the percentage of the profit pool and you look at the margins associated, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, Whistler's 10x per gram as a discount flower, you're going to start to see us move pretty strongly into the areas I've talked about. Um, you've seen it on vapor. You'll see it on pre-rolls. You'll see it on concentrates. And so I'm not worried about the contribution of our profitability. Um, being reliant upon low-cost flour and the commoditization of that particular aspect of flour, I think, is not a great place to be. And so, you know, we're confident with our, with our plan. And I think having um, – being blessed with such premium assets is really going to be important. And, you know, for everyone that has this sort of belief, and I know you don't, but that, you know, this whole thing is just going to be commoditized – I would draw your attention to what we're seeing in California and Colorado 
and, you know, over a 50 to 100 years of regulated products, there is clearly a place for premium products in the regulated space and clearly a place as being demonstrated for premium products in um, the cannabis business. And as you know, the margins of those derivative products are 2.0, as some may call it, or way, are, you know, are stronger. So, Glenn, do you want, would you please uh, take Pablo's first part of his question? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, Pablo. Um, yeah, listen, uh, we have a range, and as we're kind of closing our books, uh, you know, it looks like we're getting towards the upper end of the range uh, and potentially a little bit over. Um, I wasn't comfortable giving you guys any sort of additional guidance beyond that range or shifting it until we got through all of this, the review, the closing, the final closing, the books, and the review with our auditors. And, for instance, you'll see in our MD&A uh, where we disclose more, um, we parse, you know, our revenues, in particular, um, you know, our revenue provision is about a million dollars lower than it would have been the previous quarter, and that all takes time to work through. Um, so, you know, the the outcome we knew we were at the at the top or maybe slightly over. In fact, as we looked at, you know, um, as I say, finalizing the book and recording all the proper provisions and things like that, we we ended up coming in slightly above the um, the range. But that's about it. That's good. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Pablo. Our next question comes from the line of Michael Lavery with Piper Sandler. Please proceed with your question. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Michael. So can you, even if the timing of, of any entry into THC in the U.S. Is, is certainly unknown, how much thought have you given, given to your strategic approach or how you would plan to go to market? And, and specifically, curious how you view interstate commerce uh, do you see that as an inevitability? And, and if so, would you wait for that to come into place before trying to make an investment or entry, or, or would you go ahead and begin on a state-by-state -state approach? How, how do you think about that? Um, well, first, you know, as you look at the things that we have to do to be successful, say, in Germany or in Israel or in Poland, there are a lot of similarities to what you'd have to do in the U.S. If you look at everything we've had to do in Canada, um, you know, there are a lot of similarities to what you, what I believe you'll have to do in the U.S. So, so much of the, you know, I, I know it's fun to talk about brands and marketing and, you know, devices and formats, but, you know, the real heavy lifting is going to be on the back end. So, you know, IP, genetics, genomics, trademarks, science, compliance, um, manufacturing protocols, GMP, ISO certification, um, packaging compliance, testing protocols, sales and marketing. And, I, you know, and so if I was to ask, you know, if I wanted anyone to focus on who are the companies that are going to win long term, look at the companies that do that. Yes, clearly having some brand awareness and excellence in terms of consumer awareness will be critical. But in a new regulated category, it's going to be all of the other stuff that I just mentioned that's going to clearly make a difference. And we're working on that every day, all day, not only in Canada, but around the world. And that benefits us greatly in the U.S. Now, Michael, as you know, the, you know, the legal restrictions or the sort of different aspects of what a publicly traded company has to do in order to be compliant will require, you know, some form of a federal construct. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of different pathways to get there um, that are not just sort of a red-blue issue that can be around, you know, economics and a variety of different things. And clearly, you know, I think for the U.S. and for the states to truly unlock um, the greatest amount of economic potential, um, inter -tra you know, interstate trade and shipment will have to be there. I mean, if you look at it's somewhat of a corollary of the Farm Bill on CBD, it would be incredibly challenging if you continue to ring fence these states and have to produce, register, license, grow, um, and sell all within a state. And that really, you know, creates, I think, limitations on how you, you know, the true economics. Now, some might say, well, you know, but that's always going to exist because the states are going to want their piece of the pie of the economics of how that's grown. We don't see that in tobacco. We don't see that in alcohol. We don't see that in spirits. We don't see that in pharma. So I think, you know, as this proceeds really to unlock those economics and whether it's compliance or all these other aspects that would be there, you would have interstate. And then at that point, you're starting to get into a federal construct. And at that point, you know, things open up. 
I do, you know, and it's why well, I think we have a leading position. I do think the expertise that the Canadians LPs have will be in high demand um, for all the reasons that I've mentioned. There is nothing currently globally like Canada. Um, and while U.S. FDA and DA and other regulatory agencies don't always follow international protocols, there's no question it's going to influence it because, you know, strong neighbor, already a lot of different interactions. And so I think there is a big advantage for those LPs that have successfully navigated it. Okay, thanks for that. And, and just to follow up, you've, you've mentioned uh, genetics and genomics a, a couple times. C can you give us maybe a little more color on how you see Aurora uh, differentiated or, 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 you know, standing out there, and then, and then how that translates to marketplace execution, either with the consumer or, or anyone else? So, you know, Aurora, uh, over its, you know, lifespan has acquired significant amount of companies and resources, and with a lot of those companies has become, you know, has come a very significant library of genetics and genomics. And so, you know, like any other agricultural company, um, you know, genetics have a lot to do with yield, um, a lot to do with durability of the plant, a lot to do with the output, and clearly given the variances in how we see people use cannabis and the articulation of all those core metrics, whether it's intensity or onset or offset, genetic and genomics are, are really important in this category like they would in, you know, in most of these regulated types of categories. So as you think about that expertise and the value of that and being able to leverage that in a market the size of the U.S., it becomes incredibly important. And again, it's the, it's the life cycle of it. It's the fact that these, you know, assets and these outputs have been, you know, tried and tested in over multiple crop cycles in multiple markets in different sort of environments. And so, you know, all of those things are valuable as you get into a market the size of the U.S. where you really can't be as niche and there will be under a, you know, potential federal construct value for large scale um, agriculture like you're seeing in Canada today. And so, again, that all plays a role in, you know, how quickly and how effectively and how thoughtfully you can go to a market with the size of the U.S. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Michael. Our next question comes from the line of Tammy Chen with BMO. Please proceed with your question. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, first Good morning. question is, um, Want us to understand better the the shelf or the the 500 million US uh, ATM? Um, I mean, it's quite significant in amount. So, I mean, how should we and investors think about that? I, you know, have you taken that on um, so you can ride out you know the challenging environment in Canada, or is it also for how you're thinking about the US? You mentioned opportunistic a couple of times. So, I just wanted to understand that, given it's a pretty sizable amount. Glenn, you want to take yeah. that one? Yeah, I'll get started on that, Tammy. Uh, sure. Just, just to correct something you said, um, it's not an ATM. It's a shelf prospectus, and that just pre-qualifies shares for issuance or, or any securities for issuance, and pretty broad. It would allow us to issue debt. It would allow us to issue <laughs> shares, certainly, um, should we see an opportunity to do so. But it's not an ATM. If we were to use an ATM, we'd have to file a supplement um, to, to be able to do that. And you'd see that um, should we do that at some point. So this is really, as Miguel mentioned in his remarks, just the hallmark of a, a, you know, any mature company is having a shelf prospectus um, qualified and available uh, opportunistically. So that, that's the way to think about it. It's not uh, um, for, you know, um, with it's not an ATM. It doesn't allow us to sell shares tomorrow under an ATM unless we file a supplement. Yeah, I guess, Tammy, the only thing I'd add to it, you know, and we mentioned this a bit earlier, if you look at, you know, cash burn or the, the cash component, which has become such an important metric, um, and, you know, for a lot of good reasons, on cost and cash use, you know, we've cut about $60 million in cash expenses from SGA in three quarters. We've significantly reduced our CapEx over that time, and now really at a run rate, really focused around, you know, maintenance CapEx going forward. So I think, you know, overall the focus on cash is headed in the right direction. You know, we look at the industry, we look at our peers, you know, I'd say we're clearly, you know, well capitalized. But I think the big thing also is understanding that the market's appreciating both business execution and rock solid liquidity. And, you know, when we prove to investors we've executed on the plan we put forward, we, I really don't want that success to be overshadowed by perceived liquidity issues. 
And so as we move forward in the tactical plan, um, gaining back market share and growth of those premium segments in Canada, really wanted to have those financial resources available to be opportunistic, which, you know, you've mentioned. So I, I just would add that color about, you know, the importance of having both sides of it um, to really, I think, allow people to, you know, uniquely focus on uh, execution, particularly in the rec Canadian business. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. And I guess my follow-up is um, if you could just elaborate a bit more on um, what you were talking about in shifting more production costs from fixed to variable. I mean, does that consider even more facility closures and more leverage of third-party supply? Just, just can you elaborate on what you meant by that? Thank you. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, the, the base premise, I mean, if you go back, all you know, these facilities and the amount of production in Canada – in a lot of ways, was built to service, you know, global opportunities um, and to service a market that just is bigger than is currently there. And so, you know, I've got a long history of using, you know, variable versus fixed. And I will tell you the one thing I can predict in this category is that things are moving very quickly. And so to hardwire yourself to these massive fixed costs, not knowing exactly what the outcome is, I, I think is not, you know, doesn't best serve Aurora. Secondly, as we've all know, there was plenty of great high quality product available, particularly in Canada. Um, so, you know, while we'll have to have the EU GMP facility over in Denmark, which is a tremendous asset to have, and clearly, you know, there's plenty of, of work for that. Um, there's an opportunity in Canada, particularly with these large scale facilities. So we've announced the, you know, downturn of five of them, a couple of them are already closed. And yes, we are looking at some external sources, um, to give us greater flexibility so that we don't have to carry all those costs and also, you know, be in a good position. This would be, you know, both in flour and as well as a couple of other items. You know, if you look at, you know, other businesses I've been a part of that some might argue have been quite successful, you don't hardwire huge, you know, fixed costs. You give yourself maximum flexibility. And then once a category really is on firm footing and you can determine exactly where it's going, I think you can make more educated decisions. So uh, I'm very confident that you're going to find us to be in a strong position regardless of uh, which way the category moves, particularly in between formats. Our next question comes from the line of David Kittickle with ATB Capital Markets. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good morning, guys. Good morning, good morning. David. Congrats on the quarter. Um, I, I want to just go down into your international uh, medical cannabis opportunity a little bit uh, more in detail, if that's okay. So just to note, you know, one of your competitors also uh, announced, or who also announced results this morning, uh, for the international medical cannabis component, they, you know, sales were actually down quarter over quarter uh, versus Aurora U, and, you know, sales are up. So my question is, given just how important this, this channel is for overall, as Glenn, you mentioned, gross margin in particular, do you see this trend continuing with, with upward sales for on the international channel specifically? And I'll just note, you know, to give that co or question some color, I mean, one of the comments made by the competitor was, that it's a very crowded space. So just any color you can offer with not only market potential there, but how is Aurora kind of uh, navigating the complexities associated with uh, uh, medical cannabis on an international scale? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, so first and foremost, you know, I think we're bullish. As I mentioned before, if you think about the permissive nature or the movement of legal cannabis across the globe, um, opportunities are more prevalent and are gonna happen more frequently than the opposite. So I just, you know, would throw that out there as a general tailwind. Secondly, I will tell you that, you know, compliance, regulatory, um, having facilities in Europe, um, and, you know, the navigation of, of specific aspects about, you know, infrastructure that's focused on science, technology, and regulation are differentiators. As markets, you know, internationally are becoming more, uh, I would guess, professionalized and more sophisticated you know, I think companies like Aurora will be advantaged if they can produce, you know, the quality cannabis in a certain manner um, with a certain level of infrastructure. And so, listen, we're in early days here, and I'm not, you know, here to dismiss or, or be critical of any of our competitors because I have great respect for them. We like where we're at. We like the possibilities that the EU facility in Denmark provides for us, and we like the conversations that we're having um, with external partners based on our history of compliance and science-based production. 
And I think, you know, as long as those, you know, tailwinds continue of cannabis, you know, being permitted and being opened internationally, I think, you know, what we bring to the table and continue to invest in uh, will be a compelling argument. Well, just add okay, a little thanks. bit to that. Sure. And, sorry, just, um, you will see in our MDNA where we pull apart the uh, international business, you can see the, the revenue is mainly generated out of flour, and there, and there is a developing uh, market in Germany, actually quite a healthy one for ec- extracts and oils and things. So um, it's important to note that the licensing that we got at our Aurora Nordic uh, facility in Denmark includes uh, oil, so it's flour and oil, and we intend to use that facility to supply the um, European markets and international markets, in fact, whether it's Europe, um, Israel, or whatever, um, and, and free up you know, the the Canadian facilities. But the oil licensing out of Nordic is important because that's an opportunity for us to grow in Europe uh, in a a part of the market we haven't actually been participating in very strongly. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, So certainly it sounds like there's a lot of room for growth there. Um, My follow-up question is on just shifting gears altogether to beverages. Um, I know Aurora currently does not have a presence um, in the beverage category. Maybe that's because in the U.S. they've, they've been kind of a flop. Um, but with all the technology that, that Aurora and others have had, we're seeing an uptake of beverages specifically in Canada. So I'm just wondering, do you have a preference either way moving forward? Is beverages a, a category that you're looking uh, to get into? Thank you. Uh, well, we do have a beverage in Canada. We have a shot, which has done quite well. I mean, my opinion – on beverages, I guess, is a, is a couplefold. First is, um, in these categories, I would argue that there's not a significant advantage in being first mover. You know, we've seen that in a variety of other corollary categories around. I'm very respectful for what our competitors done. Um, I think what's more important is having a strong innovation system. Can you bring high quality products to market that meet consumer needs at a proper price point. And I believe Aurora is developing those capabilities, and you've seen it with Vapor. Secondly, if and when there was going to be an opportunity in beverage, um, clearly we have all of the other pieces put together and all of, uh, you know, plant genomics and everything we would need in order to play in that category. What I do believe, though, is that this category is moving so quickly that to make outsized bets and presuppose exactly where the consumer is going is a mistake. So we are going to um, continue to offer a variety of consumer options, particularly in emerging categories. And I could argue that concentrates, vapor, and pre-roll today um, have much more actionable opportunities from an economic standpoint. And if and when beverage or any other category like that emerges, will be there. Um, I will also say that we see in California and Colorado that those are really – bellwether states and operate about, you know, about a year, 10 months to a year from a consumer standpoint ahead of where Canada is at. And if we start to see inclinations that beverage or something else is really taking off in those markets or any other sort of, you know, bellwether market that we get consumer data on, we can quickly pivot. So um, I respect others making that push. Um, we don't see it as an opportunity today, but if and when it was there, we'd be there. Um, and like I said at the beginning, uh, these categories are not one where first mover status matters. Our next question comes from the line of John Zimparo with CIBC. Please proceed with your question. Thanks. Good morning. Um, good morning. Good morning. The, the factors. Good morning. The, the factors you listed as being success indicators like uh, IP, science, and testing and packaging, um, I'm trying to get to how you monetize that. Does it assume a federal pathway to operate in the U.S. and Aurora is the one executing that? Or is, do you think about it as selling that expertise to local state-level providers? Uh, or is there an assumption of an additional equity investor partnering with Aurora? Uh, I know there's a great deal of unknowns there, but just would like to get a sense of how you think about monetizing uh, the factors where you lead U.S. or international competitors. Well, listen, it's a great question. I think there's the, the good news is there's a ton of different ways to do it. I mean, if you look at companies like Monsanto or you look at other companies um, that are branded companies, there's a variety of different ways to get there. I think the main thing to understand is, you know, at the time in which the U.S. legalizes, you know, cannabis, either at the medical side or on the rec side, clearly the Canadian companies are going to have a massive head start in terms of understanding what that type of construct means. So listen, whether that means we're opportunistic through M&A, whether there's, you know, licensing, whether there's, 
you know, intellect, IP, all types of things. What I do know is that our continued focus and effort in being compliant and being thoughtful around the globe outside of the U.S. puts us in a position where others are not. And I have, listen, I have tremendous respect for the MSOs in the U.S. and what they've done, but the fact of the matter is they have not operated in the federal construct. They have not operated in all of these different markets and that is a different animal. And so whether that's a partnership, whether that's a go it alone, whether that's a variety of things, I'm not going to stand here and sort of presuppose what that is. But what I can say is all the hard work that we're doing around the globe to be successful is portable, can be plugged and played into the U.S. And so there's no disconnect there. We don't have to take resources away from what we're doing to be more attractive to the U.S. We don't have to focus on that. So we continue to be in a good position of optionality. Um, and, you know, like I said, it's, the Canadian LPs are going to have a significant, um, you know, set of resources that upon federal legalization of either side will be, you know, I would argue uniquely valuable. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, I'll pass it on. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Matt McGinley with Needham. Please proceed with your question. Thank you. My question is on the uh, cash bridge. You, you started the second quarter with $133 million in cash, and with the equity raises you did, at, in, in, and with the cash balances that you had, I think on November 6th, you had $250 million, and in pledge you still, I think, had around $15 million in, in cash losses. Are the, are the 2Q cash losses still on the operating side and that the revenue isn't covering the cost, or is this more related to working capital and, and, and CapEx? Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I, I think I mentioned in my remarks and maybe it just passed over fairly quickly that we did have a, a couple of the, you know, the, the larger annual costs in, in October, uh, including our insurance, um, which is, um, you know, in excess of $10 million paid out in October and also our employee bonuses, which is in the same sort of neighborhood. So. I take those out of the, that cash burn in terms of trying to focus on, you know, what operations is delivering right now. Okay. In a European facility, I know you noted an increase in production costs related to that the ramp of the uh, the Nordic One facility in Denmark. When would we expect to see that fully operational? And, and you know, I guess when when could that impact the medical segment revenue? And given gross margin rates are already pretty high in that segment, would that have a, a positive impact on those gross margin rates or is it sort of net initially because the, you know, I guess more efficient, larger Canadian operations would be offset by this smaller European operation out of the gate? Yeah, so um, uh, it's operational now. I mean, that's why you're seeing the ramp-up costs as they build inventory. We were simply waiting for the, all the licensing. All the licensing is in place. I believe, you know, just, um, you'll see, uh, we expect to see sales from that facility in this quarter into Europe into Germany and other places. And, you know, simply it's just the import export permits that, um, you know, it's the typical process now and, and may take a week or two for those. So uh, it's uh, a facility that was built with a lot of similarities to our existing facilities in Canada, uh, built by the same, you know, we built it or we, we retrofitted an existing uh, facility there. So it's um, a very efficient producer and operated a fellow named Mads Peterson, who's third generation agricultural grower in the Netherlands and I believe is or in Denmark is one of the largest um, tomato exporters in, in in the area as well. So a lot of history there, a great operator and a facility that's sort of built um, in a similar method to the way we built Canada. So we expect it to be both um, a high yielder and very efficient operator. Next yeah, I guess the only, other, the only other point I'd make there is that, you know, EU GMP is going to be an important designation for the, all, all the other markets as well. And so while it's more expensive and harder, um, there's value there, plus also navigating that, again, builds capabilities for us in other markets. Sorry, operator. Our next question comes from the line of Owen Bennett with Jefferies. Please proceed with your question. Morning, guys. Hope all well. Morning, Owen. Morning, Owen. Just uh, the one question from me on, on dried flour. So sequential decline driven by daily specials, so arguably in line with, with the new strategy and putting less focus there. But the balance being flat would also suggest share loss continues in the other more premium brands, which is not in line with the, with the new strategy. 
ideally we'd like to see this moving upwards. Can you maybe speak a bit more to this and when would you expect to see share on the premium brands in flower start to pick up with the actions that you are taking? Thank you. Sure. Uh, well, listen, I, I've just gotten in the seat. And so, you know, some of these things take a little bit longer. What I can tell you is that you're going to see a significant focus on our premium flower. And then we have some tremendous brands, as you know, Whistler, Sandrap, and Aurora. The company, you know, had – uh, gone through a lot of transition, as you know, in the first half of the year, and there was quite a bit of interest um, in getting to that transition. And then, to be honest, that daily special launch that happened in February and March, you know, was so, you know, I think took everyone by surprise. So there's a couple things going on. First and foremost, it takes a little bit to get those premium brands resettled. Secondly, uh, we've had very substantive and good conversations with our trade partners about that. Um, and third, we have to look at, um, in some ways, looking at the better articulation on format and packaging, and those things take a little bit longer um, than just flipping a switch and saying we care about Sanrap, uh, Whistler, and Aurora. So I, I don't want to give you timing. I think, you know, listen, I'm impatient uh, with all things. I think, you know, as you look at the headset and body data, retail takeaway data, you will see it. What I can tell you is that you're not going to see competing priorities from us. You're not going to see us try to do both things exceedingly well because I don't think you can. So our focus will be on the premium flower and not on the deep commoditization that's happening on the low-cost flower. And what has not been mentioned today is that you've got 1,300 stores, uh, which is an amazingly small amount of stores, and you can muscle 1,300 stores through marketing, trade marketing, um, and sales execution, all of which I've got a long history with. And I can tell you that our focus of those resources will be on premium products and premium accretive margins such as uh, vapor and pre-rolls. So I know that's not the exact answer from a timing standpoint you want, but you know better than anyone and have access to that data, you'll see how they're doing, and I'll be – We'll be happy to answer it as we go along. Okay, thanks very much. Very helpful. Thank you, Owen. We have reached the end of the question and answer session. Mr. Martin, I would now like to turn the floor back over to you for closing comments. Well, thank you. And I want to thank everybody for your questions. You know, we really appreciate your interest in Aurora. Um, and while it's early days under my tenure, I'm very excited about where we're going. And I really am appreciative that all of you took the time here today. And lastly, and probably most importantly, from all of us, we hope all of you are safe and healthy. And we look forward to seeing you soon in person in the future. All the best. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's teleconference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation and have a wonderful day.